All right. Okay. I want to do a quick video about um, the most erroneous things that exist in the world of palmistry and the things that um, I really think shouldn't even be part of hand reading. And um, I will not be teaching these things um, because they have two full of errors um, that they are either wrong or they're incomplete or they're misleading or they're problematic in a whole other bunch of different kinds of ways. And I'm gonna make a list for you right now of the things to look out for to avoid if you're interested in studying hand reading. So these are the things that you will often find in palmistry books. Um, and then most of them are based on the uh, orientation towards palmistry that was developed in the 19th century following Da Pontigny and Deborault. Da Pontigny and Deborault were the two French authors writing in the 1840s and 1850s who kind of revived this whole interest in, in, in handwriting at that time and spawned many copyists. Most of the Victorian palmistry is a copy of them and much of modern palmistry is a copy of those two authors plus the writings of William Benham and the writings of, of, of William John Warner, also known as Cairo. So Da Pontigny, Deborah, Cairo and Benham are probably the foremost uh, uh, authors of handwriting in the palmistry in the 19th century, and they are the four most problematic, and they're probably the four that need to be most ignored. Um, so I'm going to start, and I'm, gonna, I'm not criticizing them all in, in great detail, but there's some things that are completely wrong that have sort of apparently stood the test of time despite and been perpetuated uncritically, but need to be removed or excised completely from your understanding about what the hands are about. Let's start with this Da Pontigny's hand-shaped classification system. So Da Pontigny invented a sevenfold classification of hands based around the back of the hand and the perception of the tip shapes um, and the knotty, the joints, of the, whether they were knotty or smooth, plus an elemental hand shape type, elementary hand shape type, and then a sixth, uh, seventh, sorry, a sense type, which is a mixed type. So he basically created this erroneous hand shape classification based upon whether or not the tips were square, conic, or spatulate, whether or not the joints were knotty or smooth. And he then said, oh, but lots of people have got knotty joints and spatulate tips and spatulate tips and smooth. So these are kind of these mixed types. And it's not a typology at all. It's just a conflation of different ideas that don't work. And that hand shape classification system has been used extensively by hand readers. And as I've mentioned elsewhere, what they fail to note is that hand shape system is not to be used for the hands of women. Da Pontigny only developed it for the use of the hands of analyzing the hands of men. So knotty and smooth fingers, they're something that often talks about in, in these handwriting books because they copy in Da Pontigny. It's not that significant. The major airline is a much more significant indicator of the way that someone thinks rather than whether or not they've got arthritic joints. The fingertip shapes are hard to discern and not sufficiently demarcated for it to be clear. And again, aren't that significant in terms of the many other things that are more significant in the hand. Um, so those are three things that come from, come from Da Pontigny, which I think are not valuable to use and should be ignored. Um, the next thing I think is important to, to be very, very aware of, wary of is this notion of the three worlds, which is an idea that Deborah brought into palmistry when it was revived in the 19th century. That's actually not um, his idea. He's drawn that from the Western Hermetic traditions. Um, you find people like Dylan Warren Davis writing about it in his book as well, although Dylan's pre presentation of it is much more coherent and much more intelligent and based upon how 17th century chiromancers were thinking about hand reading uh, back in the day when astrology was still a subject held at university. Uh, Dev Hall's ideas are kind of watered down versions that are badly applied and then misunderstood and then misunderstood again by the next generation of hand readers who copied them. Um, so there's, that's something that should be avoided too, this division into the three realms, physical, mental and celestial, which is not really a very good way of looking at the hand. Um, nomenclature, the nomenclature has to go. Um, people always call this Jupiter finger, they say that's the Saturn finger, and they say that's the Apollo finger and the Mercury finger, and the, the, the thumb is ruled by Venus. And that is apparently the traditional rulership of the planets on the hand. But that's not that ancient. Uh, in the 15th century, they had different allocations of the planets to the fingers. And before the 15th century, in European traditions, they had no allocation of planets to the fingers at all. It's not old. 
the idea of, of fusing astrology and hand reading. And again, that was just primarily developed um, extensively during the 17th century and 16th century by people like Taisnier, Saunders, Jean Belot, George Rothman, Johannes Rothman and George Walton. So those kind of authors in the 17th century were very keen to unite hand reading and astrology together. Um, though in contemporary times, we can we can see quite clearly there is no connection between astrology and hand reading. They're two completely different subjects, and there's no reason to be using those planets on those digits whatsoever, and there's no reason to invoke that symbolism. And nothing else, it confuses people to think that the hand can show something to do with your astrology, when in fact it can't. If you want to do astrology, go and see an astrologer, not a hand reader. Um, there's a whole tradition of Indian palmistry, which is complete nonsense, where they talk about how you can actually work out the ascendant from looking at the fingerprint pattern on the thumb, which is kind of like a major uh, indication of the kind of conflation that goes on within those traditions. Um, because obviously fingerprinting isn't a traditional Indian palmistry thing at all. Fingerprinting was only discovered in the, in the 1890s. Um, and it's, although it's an important part of modern chirology, it's not a part at all of, of traditional Indian palmistry. So I don't know what they're doing with that, with that at all. But this assertion that you can say whatever the whatever this, the sign of the person's ascendant from looking at the fingerprint alone is clearly an absolute load of rubbish. There are 12 signs of the zodiac, therefore there are 12 possible signs that could be on your ascendant. And there are only seven types of fingerprint pattern, two of which almost never occur on the finger or the five, on the thumb. So there are only five, five fingerprint patterns and 12 signs of the zodiac. So clearly that doesn't work. So, but these kind of attempts to kind of unite astrology and hand reading together are, are, are bound to fail. Now, I'm not critical of astrology. I am actually a practicing astrologer as well. Um, and I think there is a utility in employing astrological symbolism for interpreting the hand, but not in the way it's been done traditionally. You have to understand that the, app, the appellation of the astrological planets to the digits in the past of the hand was innovated a long time ago. Um, for example, before the discovery of Uranus, Neptune and Pluto, so before 1781. Um, and those traditional rulerships of the different parts of the hand is completely arbitrary and not consistent. As I said, if you go back to the 15th century, you can see different, different planets are put on different fingers, Mars even on the little finger. Either way, whatever way you want to argue that, the notion that the Venus is on the thumb is obviously completely incorrect, given the thumb. In palmistry itself, they say the thumb is to do with willpower and determination. And Venus, whatever else you understand about Venus as a planet, it's not about willpower and determination. If they said the Mars was on the thumb, I'd probably have a little bit more of agreement with that, but not Venus. So the fact that palmists continue to put Venus on the thumb tells you that they neither understand the thumb, nor do they understand astrological symbolism. And the fact that someone's doing that means you should probably stop listening to them straight away. All right, let's go full Monty now on the whole William Benham issue, because William Benham is the kind of guy who really put mounts on the map and astrological symbolism to the fore in his seminal work, The Laws of Scientific Hand Reading, which, of course, is neither scientific nor is it providing any laws. Um, it's one of the worst books ever written on palmistry, and you should consign it to the dustbin. It is responsible for more misunderstandings about, about the significance of hand reading than almost any other books single handedly. And it's still regularly at the top of the bestseller charts. And I have absolutely no reason understanding why that is. And, look, and I'm not. And I'm not saying I haven't read it. In fact, it was the very first book on hand reading I ever purchased. But it's a 650 page book. The second half of it, the second 300 or so pages, is all about the lines. And there are no illustrations no, of, of handprints in that whole part of the book. It's all line drawings. So that means that we, what we know from that is that we don't know whether what he's drawn is a reliable representation of lines he's seen at all. And he's talking about combinations of lines in the hand that are, are obviously exceedingly rare because of some of them I've never seen in 40 years. And I would like to see proof. So the problem, the problem with that Benham, is, at least in part, is because he's got all these illustrations in his book, but without actually illustrating the prints and to 
prove that what he's saying can be actually seen in the hand. That's the first thing. The second thing is he develops, uh, he has a very strong emphasis upon the mounts and he develops a whole typology based around mounts. And the problem with the mounts are, how the heck do you analyze which one is a big and well-developed mount? The mounts are the areas of palm, like the, this palm here, the back, the ball of the thumb, all these parts under the fingers, they're all different sizes and shapes. And it's very difficult to compare and contrast which one of those is therefore a well-developed or big mount, which according to him would then show the predominance of that particular planet or influence in your life. Now, it's obvious to see that the ball of the thumb, the Mount of Venus, is always going to be bigger than the mounts that are found under the four fingers. So does that mean everyone's a Venusian type? No, obviously everyone isn't just a Venusian type. It's a, it's a, it's a nonsense to, to hypothesize a system for classifying uh, hands where one part of the hand is always going to be the biggest part of the hand. And secondly, within that system, he also says, oh, but most people don't have an amount of Saturn and it's, and it's not well developed. It's actually diminished, it's a valley, which is quite evident when you look at hands. But that's often the case. But that goes against completely goes against its theory that if it's if it's a well-developed planet, it should be high, not low. And the deficiency of Saturn is clearly no good either, and more the deficiency of Venus is. So it's a system that's based upon a flawed feature of the hand to be using as a personality assessment. And again, he's not using all the planets, and again, he doesn't understand the planets because he's not an astrologer. And it's 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 an unworkable system, yet. He wrote a second book called How to Choose Vocations on the Hand, which I think came out in 1932, which was basically um, how vocational chirology based upon the mounts. So he spends far too much emphasis on the mounts, and they are not important at all. They absolutely do not describe personality and character, and they're not, they're not helpful in any way to, to actually interpret what's going on in the hand. Um, but it kind of ties in with this commonly held practice within palmistry books to then start looking at crosses and squares and triangles and stars to be found on each of the mounts, which are then interpreted in some kind of superstitious and nonsensical way. Any book that spends a lot of time on, on that kind of approach to handwriting, throw it in the bin. Absolutely no good as a point from point of view of learning anything significant about the hand. Um, just that kind of superstitious approach to hand reading is really, really problematic and detrimental to the study of chirology. Oh, equally, the so-called marriage lines and the so-called baby lines, which is to do with these little bit of lines that occur at this part of the hand here, apparently. Um, no hand reader that I've ever spoken to has ever used those in any kind of successful way to either show or demonstrate either marriage or babies. And here's the thing, even if you're looking at that part of the hand, and you're saying, oh, this means you're going to get marriage twice. And that line there says you're going to have three babies. When is that ever corroborated? The only way that a palmist could corroborate that would be if they had a return visit with that client, say, 20, 20 years later or 30 years later and looked at them again and said, oh, look, you, it, I said you'd have three marriages and three babies. And there you go. That's what happened. There's no way of, of, of validating those claims because people don't do that. You'd have to take a handprint to verify whether or not the hands have changed or not. You'd have to make a note of the date that you took the handprint. You'd have to keep in contact with the person for 30 years. And you'd have to do that uh, for many, many people to kind of verify the assertion that you're making. And it's, there's no way that any hand reader could do that. Uh, most people only go for hand reading once in their life and they don't go for repeats. And if they do go for repeats, they may not remember what you said 30 years ago. So ideally you have it recorded as well. So you can actually have proof of that what you said. But without, without, without at least a follow-up uh, consultation 10, 20, 30 years later, how could you possibly verify that what you said in the earlier consultation was true and worked out to be a prediction that could be right? There's absolutely no way that anybody is doing that anywhere in the world whatsoever. I mean, I've got handprints of people that I took 35 years ago, um, mainly members of family and close family friends. Um, but I know that's relatively an exception to have a collection of, 20 or 30 handprints I've taken over that time. Um, so it's just not relevant. It's just not important. You know, you, have, you want to get married? Get married. You want to have babies? Well, I don't want some white guy telling some girl how many babies she's going to have. That rather takes away the point of, of female liberation, really. But 
it's not something that can be done for the hand and it's not something that should even be talked about. So if you've got a book that contains that sort of stuff, throw it in the bin. Same for the resets. The resets and the significance of the resets, that comes entirely from medieval chiromancy and anything that comes from medieval chiromancy, including looking at the great triangle or the quadrangle, is clearly nonsensical. And if it had any sense at any time, its sense was in the context of feudal uh, feudal feudal times of the 15th century when life was nasty brutal and short and being concerned with how long you were going to live is obviously very important being concerned whether you were blessed by god was also really important hence also the marks to be found in the hands as well like crosses the cross clearly in a theological context is the mark of death because that's how jesus died on the cross so that whole approach to hand reading comes from a political and economic system where there was no mob social mobility. You were born a serf, you died a serf. Life was nasty, brutal and short and the average life expectancy was about 30 years. And everything was, and the entire way of looking at the world in Europe at that time was completely dominated by the Roman Catholic Church and, and Christian belief. So any hand reading that was born in that time is completely irrelevant to modern. So, so let's get rid of the let's get rid of the marriage baby marriage lines, the baby lines, the how long you're going to live lines, the great triangle and the quadrangle, and this whole notion of making predictions and fortune telling, which is obviously the preoccupation of chiromancers. You can't do prediction from the hand, William. All right, I mean, and that's that kind of therefore lends us to kind of say we, we need to stop talking about things like the line of fate and the line of destiny. The line of fate and the line of destiny are kind of clearly terms that show um, the preoccupation with prediction and this belief that the lines of the hands don't change and that basically the, your, your whole life is predicated and written out and de predestined for you and there's nothing you can do about it. Um, that's, again, a sort of feudalistic view uh, of a worldview that's born out of the, the determinism of Christianity and the political determinism of feudalism. So it's inevitable that they had that kind of view of, of the hand and interpret them in that kind of way. Oh, but Benham, 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 he's just it again. What else did he do? Benham, he talks about the murderous thumb. I've already done a little video on the murderous thumb. Um, this notion of the, the thumb being a, a deformate called brachydactyly of the, of the thumb, which is a minor chromosome abnormality, being indicative that someone is a murderer. That whole idea of murder thumb comes from William Benham. And he's basically kind of told the story in that book and it's been regurgitated ever since. That thumb has got nothing to do with having a bad temper. It's got nothing to do with being impulsive. And it's got absolutely nothing to do with being a murderer. So let's just drop that one altogether. And then another kind of major error that he introduced, which is perpetuated in a lot of palms books, he has this idea that the, the major water line starts here and goes that way across the hand. If you see any palms book talking about the water line going that way, you know that they've been influenced by Benham. He was the one who introduced that idea into hand reading. And he introduced that idea to hand reading because he had this vision uh, that basically the div divine energy enters the human human being through the index finger. He was looking at the Sistine Chapel with God animating David and basically pst, sending this electrical impulse down through David. And that comes in, so through Adam, not David, and that comes in and therefore all the lines go that way. So the earth line goes that way, the air line goes that way, and the water line also goes that way. In other words, they all emanate from the index finger and go towards the down or away from there and it's quite clear that that's not the flow of the major waterline the major waterline doesn't start between the fingers it ends between the fingers it goes the other way the consistent part of the major waterline is over here that's the bit that doesn't change that's the bit that has no variation the bit that has the most variation is this end of the waterline up here so and as we know if you apply the elements to it consistency is an earth thing Variability is an air thing. So where a line is consistent will show its root, its beginning. So the beginning of the water line is on this side of the hand, not that side of the hand. So again, another idea that he's brought in and it's been introduced and he's kind of perpetuated over more. And there's one more thing in his book. He reproduces a copy of Aristotle's masterpiece as an appendix in one of his books and claims it's a text by Aristotle. 
Um, even Brent Bruning was, was fooled by that one. Um, it's not a text by Aristotle. It's a book that was published in 1684. It was a text um, about palmistry in a, in a book about midwifery. And it's got absolutely to do with nothing to do with Aristotle whatsoever. Aristotle didn't write any books on handwriting. He wrote a couple of comments in a couple of books, the Historia Animalium, for example, um, in 345 BC, but he certainly wasn't writing in 1684. So he's basically accredited uh, an erroneous source to the, to the history of handwriting, which has got nothing to do with either handwriting or, in fact, or, or in fact Aristotle. Um, so that's just bad research from the part of Benham. And yet again, many times this is, gets repeated and retold as a story that Aristotle was, was an expert in handwriting. There's no evidence that he was at all. And the books that we do have of his where he does talk about handwriting, he doesn't say hardly anything about handwriting whatsoever. So he was not an expert on handwriting in any, by any stretch of imagination. Um, the backs of the hand, that's another kind of fallacious uh, approach to reading hands, not important at all. The backs of the hand are basically um, were emphasized because of the Da Pontigny system of classification again, because if you look at the drawings in his book, it's all about the back of the hand, not the front of the hand. And we're concerned with the palm side of the hand, the fingers, the fingerprints, the lines, everything on this side of the hand. We're not concerned with that side of the hand. I mean, I've even encountered hand readers who think the knuckles are really important, and there's a little drawings and little flags in the in the uh, little markings in the knuckles that, and little flags show that some like playing golf in Scotland. You know, you'll find certain kind of nutty books that we'll talk about that sort of thing. And it's completely unverified and completely unverifiable too. So ignore those books. Um, and similarly with the back of the hand, people talk about the fingernails as if they have some kind of personality indicators. Um, aside from biting one's nails and cutting them down to the quick that would indicate some kind of anxious or nervous temperament. Um, no, they don't really show personality at all. The nails are really about um, medical indications and the most significant parts of the nails for medical information uh, on the health of the person. So, so these are a list of what about 20 different things that you can consider if you find those in palmistry books, you've actually got someone who doesn't know anything about Henry. Um, you've got, or you've got someone at the very least who's perpetuating um, half-truths, untruths, deceits, distortions, illusions, 15th century mythologies, um, and perpetuating them uncritically and unthinkingly. So if you really want to study handwriting, then you see a book with that stuff and you just need to drop that book completely because that's you're not going to learn anything from somebody who's going to perpetuate those things. They're not useful, they're not accurate, and they're not helpful. When you understand, when you come to understand how powerful hand reading can be in terms of its transformation effect within human consciousness, knowing how many babies you're going to have, or knowing how big your great triangle is, or whether or not you know your ascendant is Gemini because you've got a whirl on your thumb, it's completely irrelevant. It's completely irrelevant. So, do yourself a favour if you want to study hand reading properly. Look at the list of books that I'm going to put in the commentary below. Those are the best books that have been written in the last 100 years. Um, and they're the ones that are going to give you more, more useful information on how to read hands. And it's an interesting thing that all the authors that I've listed there do not use the Pontigny system of handshake classification, do not use Benham's system of handshake classification, do not talk about the mounts in any great or significant way. Um, don't look for signs and symbols on the hand. Don't use chronological assessment and don't do predictions from the hand. Um, they certainly don't work, do you think, use any Indian palmistry interpretations or use silly names like the line of fate or the line of destiny. So the, the more considered hand readers have already evaluated those things are not valuable and not useful. So there's a consensus in this. It's not what I'm saying is not radical and it's not new. I was talking with Andrew Fitzherbert just the other day, and he was railing against people using mounts as a, as a classification system. You know, and Andrew's a you know 40, 50 year hand reading experience. I've got 40 years hand reading experience. Johnny Finchon's got 35 years hand reading experience. People who really have studied this stuff and know this stuff are all we're all in agreement about these things. These are not important parts of the hand. They're not things that are worthy to study. They are the work they are. They need to be consigned to the dustbin. 
if you're interested in studying hand, you will forget all of those things and leave them all behind. They're just hindering you and holding you back. They are like uh, red herrings and sidetracks into, into confusion and obscurity. And hand reading is all about getting to wisdom, getting to insight and getting to clarity. So start with the books that I'm recommending below. And um, if you have any books that you think are really good, make a comment and I'll uh, give you some feedback about them. All right, speak to you soon.